I should like to speak now about the purpose of monasticism, whether on Athos or elsewhere. What is the monk here for? What is his essential task? And what service does the monk render to the Christian community or the world at large? Let me start with a modern answer by a Finnish Orthodox writer, Tito Colliander, but his words apply to Athos. A monk was once asked, what do you do there in the monastery? He replied, we fall and get up, fall and get up, fall and get up again. There you have the idea that the monastery is a place of continual repentance, of constant conversion. And that is not just a modern answer, but it is an ancient answer as well. We find it, for example, in a key text, the Gerontikon, or Sayings of the Desert Fathers, a text which is held in honor on Athos as elsewhere. For example, one of the Desert Fathers is asked by his disciple why he sits alone in his cell and weeps. And he answers, I am weeping for my sins. St. Anthony, pioneer in the monastic life, says, this is a person's chief work, always to blame himself for his sins in God's sight. In Syriac, the term for a monk is a mourner. So the monk, looked at by himself is the sinner, the poor man, defined not by what he does for others, but by his own need. A person comes to the monastery not because he makes any claim to transform society around him, but because he feels himself to be a sinner and is seeking salvation. St. Isaac of Nineveh, writing in the seventh century, is one who says, a monk is one who spends all the days of his life in hunger, thirst, and mourning for the sake of the expectation of the heavenly hope. That is a rather somber answer, what is the monk doing? And it may seem to be also a selfish answer. Does the monk care only about his own salvation without thought for the other members of the Christian family? So what services do the monasteries render to society, whether in Athos or elsewhere? A first feature that the monasteries perform, not very frequently, but sometimes, is evangelism. Some of the Athenite monks have gone out to preach the Christian faith, to go around as missionaries. One outstanding example of this is in the 18th century, St. Cosmas the Aetolian, who was a monk of Philotheu, on the holy mountain. And he went out on a series of missionary journeys round northern Greece at a time when the Christian community at a, as a whole was at a low ebb. But most monks do not expect to leave Athos in order to go and preach the faith. They would expect to stay there for life. So we might say, secondly, do the monks of Athos contribute to scholarship? 
we can recall how in the West, in the early Middle Ages, the Benedictine monasteries were largely responsible for preserving Christian civilization. But the Athenite monasteries have not been called to fulfill that kind of role because in the Byzantine era and afterwards, there was always a tradition of lay scholarship, particularly among members of the civil service. Here is what is said by a contemporary Athenite monk, Father Theoclitos of the monastery of the Unisil. In the Eastern church, the existence of the scholar monk is quite unknown. The monk finds no justification except as a worker of virtue, as a contemplative soul called by God. The cell of the monk is not a room for scholarly research and writing, but a place for prayer, work, meditation, and the tempering of the soul for special spiritual struggles in an unworldly, solitary, and quiet region. Perhaps Father Theocritus rather overstates the point here, for there have been Athenite monks whose writings have had a profound influence on the life of the church at large. A notable example, again from the 18th century, is Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, the editor of the Philokalia. And the Philokalia has had an unparalleled influence in orthodoxy over the last 200 years and is still a source of spiritual life to a very vivid extent. I suppose Saint Nicodemus was not exclusively a scholar but he certainly devoted his life to writing and editing. But that would not be true of all the monks of Athos. We might ask in the third place, are the monasteries there on Athos or elsewhere to provide social and philanthropic and charitable work service to the poor? The answer is that Orthodox monasticism in general has certainly done a great deal in the way of charitable work. Here are the words of a great Byzantinist, Norman Baines. One of the outstanding features of early Byzantine asceticism is its passion for social justice and its championship of the poor and oppressed. It has sometimes been said that the ascetic ideal of the East Roman was a barren withdrawal from the world of his day. In reality, the Byzantine, in his hour of need, turned instinctively for aid and comfort to the ascetic in the full assurance of his sympathy and succor. In general, we find frequent examples of monasteries running hospitals, old people's homes, almshouses for the poor and destitute, lodgings for travelers, orphanages, relief work for refugees. But that would be mainly the case with monasteries close to cities. Naturally, it does not apply to the same extent to Athos, which is distant from the large centers of civilization. But in certain cases, the Athenite monks have performed social work. For example, the monastery of Iviron used to run a house just outside the main monastery for lepers. I don't think that exists today anymore, but it is an example of direct social service. But perhaps a fourth feature is an important example of what the monasteries do for others, 
and that's been already mentioned by the last speaker, hospitality. The monasteries are places to which pilgrims can come, where they can remain for a shorter or longer time, sharing in the prayer of the monks. As our last speaker said, St. Benedict in the West insists in his rule that the guest is to be received as if he were Christ himself. And that would also be the attitude of Athenite monasteries. I remember talking once with the abbot of the monastery of Dionysiu, Father Gabriel, who held office for some 50 years. And he said, many of the monks regard visitors as a distraction and an annoyance. This is quite wrong. The reception of pilgrims, the providing of hospitality, said Father Gabriel, is an essential part of our monastic vocation. And he continued that as regards the money that comes into the monastery, this he divided into three parts. The first part would be divided to, would be used for the upkeep of the buildings, often old and very expensive. The second part of any income to the monastery, he said, would go towards the needs of the monks. But the third part would be devoted one third of all the resources of the monastery to entertaining pilgrims. So that is an essential task for the monk. The problem today is that many of those who come to the Holy Mountain do not come as pilgrims, but as tourists. 